anticipating our internships and internship opportunities. So um, we have a great opportunity with our um, partners from Los Alamos National Lab. And um, we have just under an hour today to really learn more about um, more opportunities and how you as um, STEM core and step 2 l students can get involved um, with the process for summer 2022. Um, so we will save and hopefully um, we'll save about 10 minutes at the end of our time today for um, Q&A if you have any questions that pop up for you. Um, but if you have any burning questions that come up, um, during the, our, our time together today, feel free to um, put your questions directly into the chat and we'll be sure to address that at um, some point during our, our, our presentation today. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to um, turn things over to our guests, um, starting with um, Cassandra Kasperson and Barbara Lynn. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Cassandra Casperson, and I'm one of the internship coordinators in the student programs office at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And I'm going to speak with you about how you can apply for internships. And then we're also going to go over resume writing. And hi, everyone. My name is Barbara Lynn. I am the lead HR journalist for science, technology, and engineering. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the partnership with growth sector and um, from internships to potential full employment with our institution. So if that, I will share my screen and we can get started. Is it gonna work? Oh yay, it's working. Okay, so um, I have been working with Growth Sector for several years now um, and their program, STEM Core, is something that our institution really values. Um, it's a great partnership and it's a way for us to have a pipeline of technicians and technologists um, into our institution. And I know in some, now that it's been here a little bit, I think if you even want to further your education um, with, if you go through an internship and potentially wind up being a full-time employee with this, you even have opportunities to further your education. So what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about the internships and that part of the STEM core program at Los Alamos National Laboratory and what we're working with, there's two potential um, pathways. There's an engineering pathway, engineering technology and true R&D engineering. And when you look at that, you can see the machinist, engineering technicians all the way up to an engineer. Um, and then you can see the computer side of it, the information technology and computer science and you're looking at certified technicians, you're looking at IT technicians at the associates level, the bachelor's level, and then you eat, at the end of that, you're gonna see our computer scientists. What I'll say with our computer scientists, because of the type of computer scientists that we have, um, not all of our computer scientists are PhDs. They may have bachelor's or they may have years of experience based upon what they're doing. Um, because it, with our institution, when we're looking at cybersecurity and other types of computer science, we're actually competing with the Googles, Facebooks, and et cetera. So when you're looking at an internship, I would look at it in terms of it's a two-way street. It's an opportunity for you to get to know our institution, look to see who we are, what we do. So for example, if you look at the depth and breadth of what we do, um, our primary mission is with um, non-nuclear proliferation. We have um, a lot of work to do with stockpile stewardship. But if you look at today, for example, in COVID, our institution has played a, a pivotal role in COVID in terms of modeling at a state level, we've worked at a national level. And so the breadth of depth of what we do is not just national security and global security. You see us play a role in the environment, you see us play a role in healthcare and other aspects of the, of the world. When you're looking at a career pathway, for example, you can look at engineering um, I would say our pathways, you could start as like a machinist, a techno technologist, technician, and then work your way all the way up to a true R&D engineer. On the left-hand side of the screen, what you're gonna see are the position job titles and the current salary ranges for that. So you can see for an entry-level machinist, it's 44K a year. 
what I want you to think about is when you're looking at our institution, not just consider the salary that you're gonna get with us, look at it in terms of total compensation, that you're gonna have um, insurance, that you're gonna have leave. Um, we have a 401k um, with um, wanting to continue your education. Um, your manager may be willing to pay for you to continue your education. We have on-site gyms and wellness programs um, and those as well. So when you're looking at us and considering us, like I was said, it's a two-way street. You get to look at us and say, I like this, I'm a good fit. We have mission and you like what we're doing. Um, and we get to look at you as well and say, yes, you're a good fit. And then um, we had the opportunity to have a conversation because typically what happens um, over the course of time with an internship, you go from being a student to where you can be converted to become a full-time employee with our institution. And I know that's what some of you are looking for, but this is an opportunity to do that. And through this program with um, STEM Corps, this is an easier way for you to become part of our student program and become part of our workforce. So when you're looking at engineering techs, um, on the screen, you're gonna see that we have different types of techs, drafting, design, electrical, mechanical, and et cetera. Um, know that for this type of technicians, we would call them at our institution, our research tech, and the starting salary would be 44K a year. If you look at engineering in terms of a bachelor's degree, we're looking at um, R&D, um, engineering. Um, what you'll see is everything from aeronautical, biomedical, um, electrical, nuclear. And when you're looking at those, you're looking at um, $85,000 a year in terms of an entry level position coming into our institution. Now let's turn and pivot over to computer sciences. When you're looking at information technology and you're looking at it from an associate's degree, um, our computer system tax and entry level position would be $44,000 a year. On this chart, you're gonna see the different types of information technology from computer, so computer support to network systems and support and analyst. So this is another potential consideration if this is what you're looking for for a career. If you look at this in terms of a bachelor's, um, you can see the software engineering, programming, data scientists, and an entry level position for us would be a computer systems professional at 64K a year. But you can kind of see the different types of requirements for the bachelor's and the type of positions that we have. So before I get to the questions, or actually there's time at the end for the questions, there's just a couple of things I'd like to say and then turn it over to Cassandra. Our institution, probably over the next year or two, we're gonna be hiring, I would say a thousand employees or more. What we're looking for are those types of individ individuals who wanna be, God, I can't talk today, it's Friday, who wanna become part of our team here at the laboratory. We're looking for those individuals who can persevere through hardships. We're looking for those who have the ability to problem solve. We wanna look for those individuals who have passion for what they do. They have passion for continuous learning. We're looking for those best and brightest to come to our institution and help support us in the mission that we have to do on a daily basis. One of the things I hear when we talk to students is because we're a national laboratory, there's questions with regard to the clearance. The clearance really isn't that big of a deal. It goes to the integrity and the ethics that you have as a person. And so what we're looking for are those individuals who can bring the skills sets that we need. And we're looking for the diversity that you guys bring um, with um, the backgrounds that you have and what you bring to the table. So know that that's an asset. I think what's important as I turn it over to Cassandra, she's gonna talk more in terms of what our student programs are, how to work in terms of looking at a potential internship um, and know that um, you are part of the future for what we're looking for our institution. Pipeline development is critical um, and we're looking for the best and brightest and those who are adaptable and flexible and wanna be part of the great mission that we have at the laboratory. Cassandra. And I will- Thank you. Stop I sharing. Up here. 
Everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Great, so I am gonna talk about our undergraduate internships programs. And I just wanna put a plug in. I mean, I'm sure, assuming you're all here because you're interested in doing an internship, but I also want to point out a couple of key reasons you want to do an internship, um, regardless of what field you're in. An internship is an excellent way to um, do career research, to start forming your professional networks. And we also know that students who participate in internships tend to earn higher grades. They tend to graduate in a more timely manner than students who don't do them. So there's a lot of really important reasons to consider doing an internship. And with our internship program, you're paired with what we call a mentor. So you're paired with an experienced staff member at the lab who works with you one-on-one -on -one to teach you skills in a particular discipline area. In addition to getting that hands-on experience working one-on-one okay. -on -one with a mentor, you also can take advantage of all of the resources provided by the office I work in, which is the Student Programs Office. Throughout the course of the year, we're always planning different types of events for students, such as um, technical talks, so that you can expand your technical knowledge. We also do a lot of professional development work, and we have opportunities for networking with other staff members and other students, and then also opportunities for social time so you can get to know your peers better, because your peers are gonna become the people that you work with in the future. They'll become your coworkers someday. So we have lots of different opportunities that you can take advantage of when you participate in our internship programs. And just to give you an idea, we have a pretty sizable internship program. Our numbers have gone down a little bit as a result of COVID. However, in regular years during the summertime, which is our largest um, season for internships, we have about 1800 interns from high school all the way through doctoral level interning at the lab. So that's a pretty big internship program. But I'm going to start just by briefly going through how you apply. And then we're gonna shift over to talking about how you can write a really strong resume. So, and like Cheryl said, feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat and we will have more time at the end uh, to answer your questions. So in order to apply for an internship at LANL, these are the eligibility requirements. You have to be enrolled full-time as a degree-seeking student and successfully complete a full-time course load each semester. Interns have to have a minimum cumulative GPA of a 3.0 on a 4.0 scale. And you have to pass a new employment drug test and be able to pass drug tests throughout the duration of your time as an intern at the lab. There's a couple of different ways that you can apply for internships at LANL, and you can actually apply to multiple different internships. That's completely fine. Um, we have what we call group specific job postings. So you would go to LANL.jobs and you can see job ads for very specific positions within organizations or you can apply to our general capability specific job postings. This is the most common uh, posting that students apply to. So we have them in the areas that I have listed there, biosciences, computational engineering, and physical sciences. And when you go into our system, which I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, but when you go into our online application system, you will find a list of majors that fit into each of those areas in the job ad. But this is most commonly what students apply for. I'd also recommend checking out our externally funded special programs. So these tend to be nationwide programs that are supported by other DOE or NNSA offices where they actually provide some funding towards your internship, which can help increase your chances of getting an internship because you come with some of your own funding. And these programs also usually have a cohort model, which is really nice. So you come in with a group of peers who are usually in similar disciplines to the one that you're in, and you work with them on structured assignments or deliverables throughout the, your time as an intern. 
So these are really great options as well. There's the community college internships program for students pursuing associate's degrees um, who are interested in say the technologist or technician type positions. And then there's also the science undergraduate laboratory internships program, which um, can be for students pursuing an associate's or a four-year degree, but those are typically students who want to go on um, and do research in their field. And so definitely check those out. There's lots of different internship options. And I will be sharing these slides with um, Cheryl and Myra, and they can distribute to you them to you after this presentation so that you'll have access to all these links that I have. <clears throat> So in order to, order to apply, you're going to go to lanl.jobs. I'd highly recommend using Firefox. It seems to work best with our online system. But when you go in there, you're going to create a application account in our iRecruitment system. So it's just going to be a brief online application where you fill out things like your contact information. And then you're also going to be required to upload a cover letter a resume and a current unofficial transcript. And when I say current, I mean it should have all of your grades that you have earned to date on your transcript. So those three things are required to have a eligible application. So you really wanna make sure you get all three of those documents uploaded. We're gonna be talking about resume writing more in depth after I finish this section. But in your cover letter, you want to make sure to describe key aspects of your background. You know, what are your primary achievements? What are your primary experiences that you have that would make you a good intern at LANL? And I also have our internship program website on here so that you can learn more about all of our different options that we have. The capability specific postings that I talked about, so the bio, engineering, computational sciences, physical sciences, those actually opened on August 1st. And the deadline to apply to those job ads is March 30th by 11.59 p.m. And that's mountain time. So just make sure that you're aware that it's mountain time. However, and, and Barb said this when she started, uh, when we started talking today, but I would not wait till March 30th. If you really want a position at the lab, I would say apply in by early January. You want to get your application in as soon as possible. Students who apply first are much more likely to get selected. Okay, so I would not wait until that last date. When you go into iRecruitment, I just wanted to point out this is what it's going to look like when you get to the online system. You'll see over on the left hand side in this blue box here that it says create a LANL jobs account. So you'll click register and that's where you're going to create your account and upload your documents. When you go to the website and check out the ads, you're going to see numbers associated with them. So in this center area here where you see the vacancy name, this just makes it easier if you plug the number in and go search, um, then you'll know which ad you're applying to. You know, that you're applying to the correct ad. So that's what it looks like. So if you see this, you'll know you're in the right place. <laughs> Just a couple of tips. We are going to help facilitate finding you a mentor if you apply, but mentors really, really like it when students are proactive and reach out to them directly and show that they've done their research on the institution. And so um, what you can do is use these resources that I have on this slide. We have what we call a project description book. We put a new one out every single year and it highlights about 200-ish projects that interns worked on during the summertime and we organize it by discipline area. So if you're really interested in engineering, you can go to that section and read a sample of the different projects that students worked on. This is a gold mine of information because it will tell you about organizations at the lab. It will tell you the name of mentors at the lab. And of course, the type of projects that you can work on. So this is gonna help you write your resume. It's gonna help you write your cover letter as well. So make sure you take that time to do research 
about the project opportunities. And then also you can use the Science and Innovations webpage to learn more about LANL, about the work that's being done at LANL and how LANL fits into the DOE, the Department of Energy as well. Those are all the kind of things you wanna be researching and learning in order to write a really strong cover letter and resume. And that'll help you match up like, I've had these experiences that match up with this work that's being done at LANL, okay? There's also a link on here to the, all the lab organizations. And we have, the lab is quite large. There's about 13,000 people working at LANL and there's lots of organizations, lots of different opportunities for you to reach out to prospective mentors. So when you go through all of these resources, start compiling lists of people, staff members at the lab that are working on projects that interest you. And then you can email me their names and I will give you their email addresses so that you can reach out to them directly um, you can share your resume and your cover letter, tell them what you applied to, explain why you're interested in doing an internship with them specifically. This is great not only to facilitate a placement, but it's also an important way to start developing those professional networking skills and getting accustomed to reaching out to people who can be beneficial for you in your professional and academic careers. So let me switch over to my resume presentation. Close that one. So in this resume writing uh, presentation, we're gonna talk about what is a resume and a traditional structure for a resume. When you get more advanced in your professional career, you might wanna try out different formats, um, organize things maybe a bit differently. What I'm gonna go over is a very standard template and in general, what we expect to see when we get an application at the lab. Uh, and so, I think once when you're early on in your academic and your professional careers, it is good to kind of stick to a template to make sure that you're getting all of the information that you should have in your resume. And the same goes for a cover letter as well. You know, when you're looking up how to do that, if you don't have one already, look at the structure that people recommend for early academic, you know, students who are early in their academics or their professional careers. So to start out, let's talk just a little bit about what is, you know, actually a resume doing for you, okay? And what is it? So your resume is a summary of your relevant qualifications. And I'm emphasizing summary because it does not need to be a comprehensive explanation of every single thing that you've done, right? It should really highlight the main points of your experiences and it should highlight experiences that are relevant to the position that you are applying for. It's also an individualized document. So you should not be using the same resume over and over and over again for every position. You want to tailor it to the position that you're applying for. It's also a tool to get an interview. So that's why it's really key to highlight those relevant qualifications that align with the position that you're applying for. You want the person who's looking at your resume to go, wow, this person meets these five areas that I really wanted to have in a prospective intern. So you're really trying to target what makes you stand out, what ma would make you a good match for that position. This is really important and sometimes forgotten, but your resume is a marketing tool. And when I say that, I mean that it should be aesthetically pleasing. It should look professional and it should be easy to read. The way that it's organized and the way that it looks makes it much easier for the person who's reviewing it to read. And the way that it's organized also highlights the most important information. Writing a resume can be a little intimidating. 
And I totally understand that. So some ways to um, kind of mitigate that intimidating factor is to make sure that you're researching the prospective employer. And I talked about that a little bit. And this doesn't just go for Lanl, right? This goes for anything that you're applying for in the future. These skills of developing a resume are important for employment, but they're also important for applying for scholarships or applying to be part of organizations. These kinds of skills are applicable for all of those different areas. So you should always do your research on your prospective employer or the organization that you're applying to. So make sure that you're taking the time to read their website. This is key and not everybody does this. And when you do do this, it makes you really stand out. Taking that time to do your research and being proactive. If you don't understand something that you find on the website or you don't understand something about the application process, reach out to people who can help you. And that's me. So if you have any questions about that, you can reach out, I will help you. So don't be shy. That's what we're here for. If you need to expand your research scope, maybe there's an aspect of something that you find on a website that you don't understand, expand your scope. I say that a lot with students who are applying to lab internships. For example, they might get their heads around what LANL is, but maybe they don't understand how LANL fits into the Department of Energy, or maybe they don't know that much about the Department of Energy. So they expand their scope, right? And you also wanna make sure that when you're applying for something, you carefully read the job ad, okay? Your job ad's really gonna give you more information about eligibility requirements and expectations, and also sometimes lays out required and desired skills that you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you address in your application materials. So once you've done your research, hopefully you'll have a good picture of what kind of intern LAN will be looking for. That's part of the reason you're doing that research as well, is you're thinking, what kind of, if I was in these people's shoes and I was hiring someone, what kind of person would I want to hire? What kind of skills and background and achievements would they have? And that's where you can start brainstorming your experiences and kind of matching them up what you think Lana would like to see. And I find that young people really sell themselves short. You guys are usually pretty amazing. You're doing all these things in your communities, extracurricular activities, um, service work, awesome projects in your classes, belonging to organizations. Take all of that stuff into consideration, especially when you're early on in your professional careers. So all of your accomplishments count. All of your accomplishments count, not just paid experiences. So I have a list there of all the different things that you should think about when you're evaluating your professional like picture of yourself, right? Take everything into consideration, just brainstorm, just start writing everything out. Then once you have it all written out, then you can take and you can categorize your experiences. Maybe you have lots of work experience, paid work experience. So that's gonna be its own section. And this is really gonna differ based on your particular set of experiences. Maybe you've done lots of paid experiences and you've done lots of volunteer work. So you're gonna have two separate sections. Maybe you have one of each of these things and that's okay. If you've got one of each of these things, you could group them all together under professional experience. So you want to organize your accomplishments in a way that makes sense based on your unique set of experiences. And I like with, with these brainstorming exercises, um, you know, just get a big piece of paper or a chalkboard or, you know, a dry erase board and just start writing all this stuff out. It, it will take some of the pressure off and help you make sure you're not missing anything. So now we'll get more into the kind of nuts and bolts things. And these things that I'm going to be sharing with you represent some of the, um, larger issues, I guess, that I see with resumes or, or things that um, should definitely be done the way that I'm talking about when I'm looking at them. So first of all, your resume should start out with your contact information. And don't be shy, make your name big and bold. And I'm talking like 
20 to 24 font big and bold. You don't want to have a tiny little name on there. You want your name to stand out, okay? You want to make sure that you're using fonts that are easy to read. It's really not a good idea to be using decorative fonts. People like me, we look at hundreds and hundreds of applications, right? And you do not want to make it hard for, for me to be able to read the information on your resume. So use font that's easy to read. You can include your, your address and you should have a phone number and you should have an email address. I recommend just using one phone number and one email address. Sometimes I see resumes that have you know, two or three phone numbers and two or three email addresses. You don't want the hiring manager to have to call or use six different contact formats to try to get a hold of you. Give them the one that you are going to check. And, and that leads to when you apply for something, make sure you're checking that phone and make sure you're checking that email address on a regular basis because you don't want to miss if someone calls you. Of course, you want to make sure that your voice message is professional. It says your name um, so that the person knows that they're reaching the correct person. If you have a professional or academic oriented LinkedIn account, website, or blog, you can also include that in your contact information. And it's also a really good idea to make sure to do a sweep of your social media to make sure it's professional before you apply for things. There are hiring managers that will look people up. They'll look up your Facebook um, and they'll look up you know, those kinds of things about you. They'll look at your social media presence. So keep that in mind. All of these different things about you contribute to your professional, um, you know, your, your professional uh, portfolio that you're putting out. So definitely check all those things out or, or make sure they're set to private. So that's a good question, Andrea. Um, I would personally recommend using your, your personal one. You know, if you ever switch schools or you graduate, you go to another school, that email is not gonna be useful anymore. And this is, this is something we run into a lot where um, a school email might not be active anymore. So if you can use a personal one, you know, use a G Gmail or something like that, an MSN account, that would be great. Just make sure you're checking it. Good question. So after your contact information section, you can have a professional summary section. Um, sometimes it's called a, um, a profile section or some people will organize it to be a objective section. But this is where you're making your point about, you know, why are you creating this resume? What do you want? What are the main things about you that really make you a good fit for the position that you're applying for? And it needs to be concise. So say who you are, an overview of your professional background, and point out the most important things that make you a good fit for what you're applying for. And it's also good to say why you are applying. And I have examples on here. I will send these slides so that you all can go through and see examples. And these are real examples of students who applied to positions at LANL and were given positions, okay? And so these are what we would consider to be really strong professional summary statements. So you can go through these later on to get some ideas. Now, of course, don't ever just verbatim copy, <laughs> copy someone else's summary, but this should give you a really good idea of how you can structure your own. And I have a couple different options here so you can check these out. So after your contact information and then your profile, statement or your professional summary, because you are still students, um, you want to have your education section. So you should be listing your school, the full name of your school, the major and minors that you're pursuing, your anticipated graduation date, and your cumulative GPA. 
Then if applicable, in a separate section, you can list all the relevant coursework that you've completed. So when you're thinking about applying for a STEM position that, and maybe you're in engineering, right? You, it's not just engineering courses. You can include your math courses that you've taken, your physics courses, anything that supports your engineering, um, your engineering background. You can include all of those things in terms of relevant coursework. And that's gonna help the person looking at your resume go, okay, this person already has um, these skills, and, and just to point out, a lot of people get nervous. They say, oh, well, I don't have that much experience. We do have internships for students at all levels, but telling us the, the most that you can about yourself will help us make sure that you're put in an internship that's gonna be a valuable experience for you. We don't want you in it, something that's too advanced and we don't want you in something that's too easy for you, right? And so giving us that kind of information about your coursework um, can really help with making sure that you have a suitable placement. Of course, if you have any kinds of publications or you've worked on any relevant projects, you can also include that in your education section. A relevant project could include something that you did for a class. Maybe you did a really big project for one of your classes that you're really proud of and that you learned a lot from. You can include that kind of information in this section as well. And then I just have examples here about uh, of how you might consider laying this out, the types of coursework you might include. So after your education section, this is where your professional experience section comes in. Your experiences should be listed in reverse chronological order. So the thing that you're still doing or you most recently did should be first and you go backwards like that. Every entry should include the title of the position, the organization's name, the city and state that the organization is located in, and the time frame that you were involved in that experience. Then you want to have bullet points that explain the things that you did as part of that experience. So what did you do? What skills did you use to do it? Or what skills did you develop as a result of that experience? Did you use any kind of tools? And I don't just mean hand tools, right? It could be software platforms, um, things like that. Like what kind of tools did you learn to use or did you hone your skills in in order to do that position? Were there any results of the work that you did? Did you, um, maybe you volunteered for some type of community drive and you raised $500 to, you know, buy backpacks for middle school children, right? Like what were the results of what you did? This is the kind of stuff that shows the person looking at your resume, what you're capable of. I recommend putting bullet points in order of importance. So what is the most impressive thing that you did in that experience? So I would put that first. When you're writing a bullet point, you wanna use action verbs. If it's a position that you are still in, it should be a, um, a present tense verb. If it's something you did in the past, it should be a past tense verb. I'm giving you all the like nitty gritty details, right? This is stuff that people like me look at. Um, and so these are these little things that can really make you stand out, making sure your verb tense is in order, making sure you're using impactful action verbs. And I do have a link to a list of these later on in this presentation. If relevant, you can look at the language of the description of the position that you're applying for and make sure you're incorporating that language into your resume because it's showing that you speak the language, right? And I'm gonna show you examples of this, but you want to quantify your experiences. Like I said, um, maybe it's a volunteer project and you raised you know, $500. You did three outreach events, 
that were full day and you raise $500. It's things like three days, 500. I worked with 50 plus people. Those are how you quantify your experiences. Here are examples of ways that you can um, quantify your experiences in your bullet points. I find that a lot of students have worked as tutors and that's fantastic. We want to see that. Whether or not it was paid, we wanna see if you um, have been involved in any kind of tutoring. That shows us that you have good communication skills, that you also know certain disciplines really well. You're good at working with people. That's all the kinds of things that that communicates to someone like me who's looking at your resume. So you can go through and look at these examples, but um, I do want to point out the tutoring one. So, you know, tutored 10 undergraduate students in algebra and calculus for six hours a week. That also shows that you balance your own course load with six hours per week of work. So that's the kind of thing that that one short sentence can tell someone who's looking at your resume. And I put just a couple more examples. I had engineering examples um, and then computer science examples in here. Other optional sections that you can have if it's relevant for you. Maybe you know a lot of computer programming languages or certain software platforms. Maybe you speak additional languages. You could have sections on those different skill sets. Whenever you can, if you are talking about a skill set, include the proficiency level. So for example, let's say you know the programming language C++ or Python. You could say, I have beginner experience in Python or I have intermediate level experience. Of course, list any professional associations you're a part of, conferences you've attended. Um, we already talked about volunteer community service activities, but maybe you also participate in science fairs or you've won a number of awards for different kinds of things that you've done. That's the kind of thing that you can also have. Like I said, don't sell yourself short. And I just have different examples of that here. I usually recommend um, at this stage to include your references on a separate page with your resume. For your references, you want to identify people who can talk about your professional and or academic skills. They should not be relatives. So you wanna be looking for faculty members, maybe your academic advisor, um, you know, former or current employers, those are the kind of people you want to list as resumes or references. Before you ask someone to be a reference for you, always make sure that you get their permission. And do that every time. If you apply for something this year and then you apply for something next year, you ask for permission again. This is also an opportunity for you to tell the person you're requesting a reference from, like, I'm applying to this specific position and I think I'd be a good fit for it because of X, Y, and Z. Here's a copy of my resume. That's gonna help them give you a really strong reference. I'd recommend identifying at least three references. And when you have their permission, you wanna put their name, their title, the organization they work for, their phone number and email address. So some notes about formatting, and this gets back to how I was talking about it being a marketing document. You know, it's a marketing tool. You want it to look attractive. In terms of page requirements, if you're applying to LANL, you can make your resume and your cover letter as long as it needs to be to communicate the relevant information about you. Sometimes you'll hear other places have a one page requirement, which pay attention if there's any you know, page limitations. That is not the case at Lano. We want to know more about you, not less, as long as it's relevant information. 
So, um, you know, I usually see that students turn in two to three page um, resumes. And that's very common for us. You wanna make sure to provide a lot of white space in between your sections. So it's really easy for the person looking at the document to find which section of your resume. You don't wanna squish it all in together so it's hard to read. With the exception of your name, which should be big and bold, in general, you wanna keep your text you know, around 12 point font and make sure it's a readable font. It's easy for everyone to read. Those are gonna be things like your Times New Roman or Calibri or Helvetica or Garamond, those kinds of things. And if you're really nerdy like me, you could go online and look up best fonts, like the hot fonts for 2021 <laughs> for resume writing. There's actually people who, who've researched that. <laughs> um, and, and there's nice ways to, to look at um, you know, different types of fonts that make certain information pop out. Don't over format. What I see a lot is students really wanna high, highlight something. So they'll bold it, they'll underline it, they'll italicize it and capitalize it. That actually does the opposite of what you want it to do. <laughs> um, and th this is really based a lot on like graphic design information and, and research. Like if you want something to stick out, like maybe it's the title education, right? Your heading education, just capitalize it. Just do one thing with it. And then you can use that other formatting somewhere else. I'm giving you the in, this is an insider tip, right? It seems nitpicky, but it's what we look for. <laughs> Of course, you want to make sure that your document is free of spelling and technical errors. This is key. If somebody sits down and they right away find a spelling error, they're probably going to stop looking at your resume. Okay, so use your resources. Use the resources you have at your school, you know, your um, teachers, your advisors family members in, you know, that have lots of professional experience, get everyone to be looking through your resume and giving you feedback. I know even I, with doing stuff like this, I make mistakes in my own documents because I knew what I meant and um, it doesn't jump out at me. And so usually in order for a document to be really good, it needs to go through a couple of rounds of revision. I'll let you guys look through some of these um, common issues. We just talked about these. We talked about these earlier on. Um, I will point out with the acronyms, a lot of people will put lots of acronyms in their um, resumes and not say what they are. So the person doesn't understand how impressive the experience was. So every time you're using an acronym for the first time, such as the name of your school, you spell it all the way out, put the acronym after it in parentheses, and then you can use that acronym thereafter, okay? But spell those things out. Like I see students do this a lot with the name of awards or scholarships, and it doesn't have the same impact when it's not spelled out because the person doesn't realize that you want a really prestigious scholarship or got a prestigious award. I have some of my favorite resources on here for resume and cover letter writing and just professional development in general. <clears throat> so I have a list of action verbs for resumes on here. You can go and check that out. Um, the balanced careers, I would say, and the muse are two of my favorite professional development resources. You can go and ask all kinds of, you, you know, find information for so many of the questions that you want to ask about doing a resume and a cover letter. I put resume fonts on here so you can check this out. <laughs> and it's also a really good idea to just look up examples of resumes in your field. You could put undergraduate resumes in mechanical engineering, and you can find lots of examples to see, okay, what's the kind of things that people put in their, in their resume? And I have my contact information in here. 
So I will stop sharing so you all can ask me any questions you might have. Awesome. Cassandra, that was so helpful. Um, I know for a lot of our students, like being able to hear like insider information like this um, is key and kind of gives like a lot more um, like context clues and um, makes them feel a lot more comfortable. I actually got a few questions um, in the chat that were sent directly to me. Of course, the fire okay. truck drives by right when I unmute myself. <laughs> Um, but one question that a student had asked is um, if they need to be a U.S. citizen in order to apply, um, if any other statuses would be accepted. You are not required to, we have plenty of internships for international or uh, international students at the lab. Um, there are, are definitely positions. It, it can depend on what, you know, some organizations for for interns who are going to stay on for a long time are going to require a security clearance and that could be something different that would be further down the road um, but we have lots of international students who are um, interns at lano and i'm sorry barb i interrupted you no you <clears throat> excuse me i was just going to talk about the clearance in terms of what you refer to because typically for a clearance at our institution you have to be a u.s citizen um, but like she was saying, we have employees um, who aren't US citizens and we have the ability to provide work for them and it's the same thing for our students. <clears throat> Good to know. Um, another question that came through the chat was, um, if you could talk a little bit more about um, how student applicants can reach out to mentors, like how soon should they be reaching out to a mentor um, before or after they submit an application? Um, is there a limit to how many mentors they should be reaching out to? Um, just what good, you're- Good question. So it depends on when you want to be hired, but if, if you're looking to be hired for the summer, I would recommend that you start reaching out to people as soon as uh, the nose, you can reach out as early as November, December timeframe. And I would make sure that you do it by early January at the latest. Um, the sooner you do it, the better. No, there's no limit. I would honestly, you can use those resources that I shared, the intern project description booklet um, and the list of organizations and the science and innovation. I would start with 10 to 15 people. I'd start by reaching out to 10 to 15 people um, and there's no limit, no. I think it's great to reach out to as many people as you can. I, I, I do think it's a good idea um, if you can to get your application in before you reach out to people. It's not 100% necessary, um, but a lot of mentors will say, oh, well, I wanna look up this person's application in the system. I do hear that quite a bit from mentors. So if you can get it in first, um, I'd highly recommend it. Thank you. Quick question, Barbara and Cassandra. Um, when you were mentioning about um, some employees or interns being um, non-US citizens, um, does that also include students like AB 540 students and Dreamers or just international? Barb, can you help me with that question? Um, I'm not sure about that, to be honest with you. I can research it and follow up with you. Um, I know that when, so when you're going through becoming a student or if you're becoming an employee, we're gonna do a background check. And so we're gonna be asking the question whether or not you are a US citizen. Um, that piece with the dreamers and that, let me double check and see. Um, I have a hunch of what I think the answer is, but let me double check and make sure so I provide you with the right information. That'd be great, thank you. Yeah, I know, uh international students and then AB 540 slash mm -hmm. dreamers do have different um, classifications. So that's why I wanted to make sure because I know we have some students. So that'd be awesome. Thank you. You're and welcome. that does make me think of another point. If a student wants to apply for the CCI, the community college internships, 
or science undergraduate laboratory internships. That program does require that a person be either a US citizen or permanent legal resident for those two programs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What other and, questions uh, do you have? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I was gonna say as we wait for, if any students have any additional questions as they come through the chat, um, I just wanted to clarify for students as well that um, I will be sending out um, this presentation along with the links for the actual um, application for um, CCI and the opportunities at the lab. Um, in addition, um, you would be still applying through the actual STEM core slash STEM to step two and L application or internal application through our program. So it's sort of like it's covering you twofold. So if this is an opportunity that you know you're interested in, you would still apply through um, the STEM core application that's been sent out through your on-campus support specialist, but you would also still go through um, this process that Cassandra has outlined um, for the last little bit. So just to clarify that you will be getting that information um, via email later today. And I'll add my cover letter presentation as well in case anybody's interested. Oh yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Cassandra. Can I add something real quick <clears throat> with regard to the cover letter? Um, for some reason, our institution for most positions require a cover letter. The easiest way to put your cover letter together is to cut and paste their minimum requirements and the desired requirements, put them into the right format. <clears throat> Excuse me, put it into the right format that Cassandra is referring to and what you'll see in her slides and answer those, uh, you're more likely to be considered and even more so be potentially get an interview because typically what happens is our hiring officials will put a spreadsheet together, put the minimums, the desired, and they'll check the box to see if you meet the minimum qualifications for the position. And that'll help you in terms of being able to be seen and more likely to be considered for an interview. But I would look at the documents that Cassandra sends in terms of her cover letter because it's really well and it'll give you some additional information that you need. But that's a simple way to do it in terms of cutting and pasting those requirements. That's a good point. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Barbara. Um, okay, so I think we, we are coming up on our time. Um, we're at the hour at this point. So um, for students, if you have any follow-up questions, um, please feel free to reach out. You should have my contact info, but if not, you can also reach out to your um, on-campus support specialist who I will be following up with in terms of um, the resources and like the links that we've discussed throughout um, our time here today. Um, but huge, huge thank you to Cassandra and Barbara for um, such a well put together presentation and all this information that I know is gonna be really helpful as um, we are moving forward with our internship process um, and as students are starting to think about it. So huge thank you. And again, students, please do not wait until March. Um, the sooner the better. So um, there's tons of resources out there through the STEM core program and through um, LAML's website and resources as well. So um, don't be shy and don't be a stranger. We're all here to help. Um, and happy Friday. Thanks for being here and have a great weekend. Thanks for having us. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.